All right, everybody, welcome to Dad Talk Today. I got a special episode. I am really looking forward to this. Uh, really quick, I want to get through this so I can get into the conversation. If you're watching the show today, please make sure to like, share, subscribe, uh, and ring the bell so you get notifications of when we go live. Many ways you can support this show down at the bottom, Cash App, Venmo, Patreon, Dad Talk Today, no spaces. There's uh, Super Chats and memberships over on YouTube. We got the same thing over on Facebook, but I'm talking to another page that talks a lot about some of the stuff that we do. Uh, you may have heard of the transformed wife. I, I love uh, what she does and what she talks about. And I know there probably gets a lot of hate because it's fighting back what we hear in society. But I was reading a post from her the other day talking about how much better her marriage has been since this transformation. And my thought was, I want to hear from the husband. And so we got him here today, Mr. Ken Alexander. Ken, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. So uh, yeah, tell I, me about this journey uh, with the Transform Wife, with what your, uh, what your wife has been going through. She has been putting out some really good education out there. And I know that it's probably uh, got, its, got its haters for sure. Well, we, she's been doing it for about oh, 12 years now. So we're kind of used to the hate. <laughs> you kind of get immune, it seems, at some point where you realize that the bark is much bigger than the bite and oh. you just have to live with it. I've had a bunch of haters try to shut my business down and, you know, do all kinds of weird stuff. It's it's amazing. But uh, the Lord is good. He's blessed us through it all. Absolutely. Trying to shut your business down. I can only imagine what that had to be like. Um you know, tell us about this, though. What inspired uh, your wife to start this and what was going on in your relationship and what's it like now that she's went through this transformation? Well, our story begins back 42 years ago, I guess now, where two young 22 year olds get married and we think it's all going to just go according to plan. We had no plan, but according to plan, hopefully God's plan. I was uh, going through graduate school. She was getting a teaching credential and we got married and moved into a 10 by 40 trailer. Oh. And that's where we lived for the next two and a half years, broke as can be, both trying to make it through grad school. And uh, as it turns out, that was probably the first year was a, a really good year, but it took a lot of adjustment um, in order to, you know, get through it. But we got through that first year and then the second year. And then finally she got pregnant and had a little baby girl, still taught for another year, hated every moment of that teaching, leaving her baby behind. Oh, yeah. And uh, then had another little boy. And I had made a deal with her that, or actually we both made a deal that once she had her second child, she'd stay home. And so she stayed home uh, from then on out. And we had, uh, I would say, a typical marriage. Now, you know, everybody thinks it was so horrible, but I've coached a lot of men in my time. And uh, because I get them from her page, they come to me asking for advice and counsel and other things. And, and I actually think we had it easy compared to a lot of the men out there. You know, it just, uh, she, was, she was pretty difficult, but... She wasn't as bad as what I'm hearing. You know, there's just some some real stuff out there that's difficult. But I just didn't realize, you know, we get married. I was a missionary kid, watched mom and dad operate. Dad was the leader. Mom was submissive. And hey, that's the way a Christian family's supposed to be. She came from a family where dad was a physician. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. But they argued all the time. I mean, all the time. They didn't see eye to eye on anything. Their personalities are completely opposite. She was a spender, he was a saver. And so you have got this little girl going to bed every night, um, crying herself to sleep at times, listening to mom and dad argue. 
Well, you can imagine then bringing that into a marriage where who knows what thoughts are in that little girl's mind that now has grown up. Um, but I found out it, it took me years, years and years to try to figure this thing out. And the first year I didn't know what was happening to me. And so I just basically went along with the flow, apologized a lot for being who I was and got things back on track and actually did that for about seven years. So I just, you know, it always came down to me, you know, going into her bedroom about eight o'clock at night where she had been crouched up, upset over something. And I'd sit beside her and say, Lori, I'm really sorry. You know, I'm sorry that one, two, three, four, five. And, and then we'd hug and we'd be back on track, you know? So, but at the seventh year, I realized that somebody like me can be wrong, but can I be wrong all the time? <laughs> I mean, all the time I was wrong. I couldn't, I just could not please this girl. And that's not to say we didn't have good times. We had good times. We laughed a lot. We had some fun times together. We had four kids together. We were raising and doing a good job on. So we had a lot of commonality. But uh, in the meantime, I was traveling 40% of the year. And uh, it was not unusual for me to get on an airplane. We were doing fine that morning. She drops me off at the airport. And that night I get into New York City, hop into my hotel room, give her a call and find out that the world is coming to an end. Uh, we just were not made for each other. You know, I'd done something wrong. And so then I'd ask the question, Lori, what happened between this morning and tonight? We were good this morning, but now tonight something's wrong. And the answer generally came back, well, I talked to somebody, you know, and when she talks to her girlfriends or talks mm -hmm. to somebody else, and I'm not the husband that she really wants, or, you know, they get into this thing about just, uh, you know, talking about their husbands and how bad they are. And so then she finally realized that, oh, yeah, you know, I, I can't talk to those people anymore because they always make me upset. So again, it's just this emotional roller coaster. So we went through that for many years. And uh, about the seventh year, I decided to take it on as a challenge to see whether or not I could make a difference in this relationship. So I went to my pastor, I went to my dad, and I got lots of answers. The answer was just love her, Ken, just love her love her more. <laughs> There's got to be more to this love thing than just love. You know, There's, I've got to be able to do something. Right. And so as this kind of coincides along with the fact that I was teaching and training uh, in my business, I was lecturing across the country and in Europe. And so I was lecturing on some items that uh, hit me pretty clearly, like, like the whole concept of you are what you think. You know, so I began to realize that if we've got a problem here, it's the way she's thinking. There's got to be some bad thinking there and I've got to isolate it. I've got to get in there and figure out what the bad thinking is. So I, I began to try to isolate her bad thinking. And that was the key was to try to figure out what, what lies was she telling herself and try to get that. Now we went to a psychologist for a little while, um, same psychologist that had dealt with her parents and her siblings. <laughs> so he already had a good background on it. But after the third visit, um, she was drawing diagrams and doing different things. And he was asking her to do this and that. And the third visit, she finally said, uh, I don't think we need to go back anymore. And I said, well, why not? Well, because he's not dealing with you. <laughs> you know, He's just talking to me. I said, well, maybe he'll get to me, you know, he'll, he'll get to me, but no, she didn't want to go back. So I had to try to do this on my own and try to figure out, okay, what lies is she telling herself and in what way can I speak truth to her? So one of the things she wanted me to do for years was walk with her. So I started walking with her every day, about 45 minutes a day. And during that time we argued. You know, that's basically <laughs> what we did. We just argued about anything and everything as we went along. And so, again, I began to isolate some of the things that she was her bad thinking. The problem is that when you've got this hurt little girl, 
and she's got bad thinking. As soon as you begin to go there and talk about it, she'll shut down. Completely shut down. Change the subject. Say, I don't want to talk about that. Because she's trying to isolate that hurt <laughs> and keep it away from herself. And she thinks that as long as I keep it packaged here, I'm going to be okay. And I realize that the only way out of this was for her to go in there and deal with that and to realize that this dad who worked 60, 70 hours a week, you know, took off at 6.30, came home at 7.30 at night, you know, and this was five nights, five times a week, sometimes on Saturdays as a physician, you know, then he'd come and hug her and she didn't want to be hugged, you know, and so he'd hold her anyway and she didn't want to be held. And so there was this love for her father that had a disdain for him at the same time. Right. So I end up being, in a sense, the person in the middle there where she's saying, I need an intimate relationship, but she doesn't know how to get there. Mm. She has no idea how to get to that next level of relationship because she's protecting herself and that little girl that's inside. So it took years. I mean, it just literally took years and tears. I, I remember crying. Because I go through these moments where I, I would say to myself, she's got it. Okay, she's got it. And she's really good for, for a day. And then all of a sudden, it all falls apart. And the main thing was, there just was this lack of respect for me. There was a lack of, um, uh, there was just, her countenance would fall around me. Because I didn't eat what I was supposed to eat. Or I didn't do this right. Or I didn't put my dish away. Or I didn't. I mean, it was a nonstop thing that I was going through. So I, again, this was a challenge to me in some ways, but I also believe that the Lord didn't put us together by accident. <laughs> that somehow, you know, I was hoping against hope that I would win my wife, and and I'd be able to to you know win her over. So that's kind of our early years where we kind of went through this. It was a tough time and yet good times. I mean, there were so many yeah. good things that came out of it. But my heart was where I knew that we had not fully connected. We just were not connected. That doesn't mean we didn't have sex. We did. <laughs> so, you know, we kept the marriage bed alive. We had good things. We went to church together. We prayed together. We even had some family devotions together. But she and I were on two different paths and we were not connected. And so that was the real challenge was how do I, how do I try to get her to that spot? Ken, let me ask you a question. While you were in the middle of that, it sounds like you've really processed that now. What was going on, talking about she needed this intimate relationship, person in the middle, everything that you was processing. Did you know that? at that point or was that something that you look back now and say this is what's going on no no it's looking back looking back it's uh, so much of this is looking back yeah no I, I didn't know what hit me you know and i think i'm in the same boat as most men is, absolutely we're trying to figure this thing out and we're chasing her down we're trying to chase down the next thing that she's upset over to deal with and we're trying to chase down the next thing that we can do to please her and to keep her happy, so to speak. And yet fundamentally at the seventh year or so, I did realize that I had to do something beyond just chasing her down. And so I began to say to her, honey, I love you, but I'm going to go play golf now. You know, I, I'm going to go live my life in spite of what you're thinking. And I didn't realize at the time, how quickly she could get over it. You know, I thought that this was going to last a while if I stood up for myself and said, no, this is what we're going to do now and just did it. And it was like three or four minutes and she was over it. So, you know, that was, that was a good secret to learn <laughs> was that, you know what, this control was not as heavy as I thought it was, you know, in certain right. things. The well, biggest I, issue was again, arguing. Yeah. Know? 
And you mentioned, you know, numerous times that you went to her and you was like, I know I can be wrong some of the times, but I know I'm not wrong all of the time. Was this something that you tried to excuse what was going on by trying to uh, take the blame for the actions? Well, it wasn't necessarily taking the blame. I believe there's a difference between apologizing and saying, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I differentiated between the two. I, I can easily say I'm sorry. Now, I'm sorry for a lot of reasons. I'm sorry we're in the fight. You know, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry that, you know, I may not have said that exactly right. But to me, that's not an apology because I wasn't wrong. Now, I don't know if other people can separate it that easily, but I do. I separate the two. And I actually suggest that to men is that you can say you're sorry. That doesn't mean you're apologizing for anything. You know, you're just sorry that we're in this boat. Now, how do we get out of it? So I was taught that you don't let your um, anger or your um, upset go past the day. In other words, at the end of the day, that needs to be resolved. And that's the reason why I ended up in the bedroom <laughs> where she goes to bed early, you know, apologizing or I would say, I'm sorry. And again, I'm about getting the relationship back on track. Right. So as quickly as possible, I want the relationship back on, on track. I'm a pleaser at heart. That doesn't mean that I'm not a director, um, you know, powerful type because I am. And she is too, which makes part of this fun is that we both have the similar personality and both want to be in control. You know, we both want to have our way. So there, our heads would knock a lot in that area. But um, again, getting that relationship or keeping it on track is probably what saved my marriage. Yeah. You know, is is knowing that, hey, you know, no, no matter what's happening here, I've got to try to keep this on track. Now, there came a time where I began to push the envelope, so to speak, or push this a little bit further. And, and I did. It was a process that that I purposefully did. And I would journal about it and write. And that's the the post you saw yesterday where, where she mentions that she read some of the things that I was journaling at the time, you know, and, and the upset in my heart over the fact that I couldn't move her or get her to see what needed to be seen. Mm. And in all honesty, some things I did get her to see, but most I never did. Most right. I never I mean, I don't know how much a part of her transformation I was. I, I certainly was a part of it. But if I was going to say it's probably a 10 percent, maybe 20 percent part, her greatest transformation. Well, it came came from two things. One was we were walking along, uh, you know, as we did every day, this 40, 45 minute walk and. And we're talking about what's life going to look like after the last kids get out of the home. Two are gone and two are in high school still. And, and I said, well, you know what? We get along, you know, we're pretty good. We're best friends, even though we fight all the time, you know, so we'll just be best friends the rest of our life. Well, I didn't realize until later how much that hit her. She didn't want to be just best friends. She always had a goal to have an intimate relationship. She just didn't know how to get there. So mm. that was one thing that I think really did impact her. And so she started studying a lot more and started looking at different things. And uh, her mother gave her a book called Created to Be His Help Meet. So that book in and of itself probably radically changed her more than anything else because it outlined all of the things that she had been doing to me over the years. It showed it clearly you know, as what it was, was that it was the wrong thing. It was sin, you know, and, and, and so Debbie Pearl does a great job in that book of exposing the things that women are doing to their men that are just unchristian. And it's hard for us men to even see it, you know, because we've right. even bought into the feminist lies that are out there, you know, oh, we, we bought in. Yeah. And so we're, you know, we're kind of going along with this quality thing and, hey, you know, build her up and, you know, let's do it this way. And and um, and we certainly we are equal. Don't get me wrong. We're right. equal in personhood. We're equal in many ways, but we're different. 
We are two different sexes, two different things. And in God's economy, God's asking me to lead the family. He's asking her to follow. And so one day coming around the corner, just down the corner right there, uh, around the block, we had been in some big heated argument. And I got to the point where I had said in my life, I would never play the submission card. I am never going to ask my wife to be submissive. That What kind of husband would ever say that to his wife? That was my thinking. But I was so frustrated. I just said to her, and we're holding hands now. We're walking along, arguing this whole time, holding hands. And uh, I said to her, I said, you know, Lori, God asks you to be submissive to me. She mm. throws my hand down, turns around, stares at me and says, I know, but you can't make me. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and I just responded kindly. I said, I know I can't make you, but that's something you need to talk to the Lord about. Now, was that before so, or after reading the book? You know, I think it was pretty much simultaneous, but I, I think it was before, actually, maybe just okay. a month or two before. You know, but that was the challenge was you really need to talk to the Lord about this. Um, and uh, and that's that's kind of the way my new operating system was, was that I had chosen that I was going to do all things Christian in my marriage, even if she didn't. Right. I was still going to be kind. I was not going to erupt. I was not going to give snide remarks anymore. I was not going to give a comeback and whack her with some verbal, whatever it is, you know? So I had to change me, which is the place I had to begin, was I had to decide that I had to take out all of the things that she could legitimately object to. I mean, there's many things she was objecting to that were illegitimate, but I had to go in there and refine myself. And that was a big discipline in and of itself. So I read the book called The Disciplines of the Christian Life, and, uh, and that's where it began. My journey began. And I actually included her in on that. Before all of this, I went to her and said, hey, I need help with these disciplines. Can you help me with them? And so I was actually showing to her what it looked like to change, so to speak. And, um, and I made some good changes, some really good changes. So, you know, I, I went through the things with her that she felt that I was doing to her that were I mean, sinful, so to speak, you know, the unkind words that I would say. And almost all of those, I mean, I shouldn't say almost all, a lot of them came in the arguing and yep. in the frustrations that I would have. I mean, you disrespect a man, he's generally going to whack you with something verbal, <laughs> something he's going to say that's not going to be kind, you know, or nice and come back twice as hard. So I had to learn to stop that. And that's where, I, if I were to counsel the men watching this show, I would counsel them that, yeah, and when they come to me, the same thing, you know, they always come to me with a solution. They want a solution for their wife. Well, let's start with you because we yeah. can't solve your wife's problems until we start with you and you solve your problems and you demonstrate for her what that looks like. How hard is it for men like. to realize that? Well, it's, it's hard for everybody. I mean, it it's, is. it's not in our it nature. It, it's in our nature to cover up our faults and right. to justify them. We, we love to, when we do something wrong, jump into our box and have all these justifications yeah. come in. And, and, and now when we're in this box of justifying ourselves, now we don't even treat the other person with common human decency. And, and we're justified in it, Right. Now, certainly our wives do that to us a lot, but we do it too. And so we have to realize that if we're not treating the other person with common human decency, and that means a kind word, respect, if we're not doing that, then we're in our box. Well, you know, and modern only... feminism, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was, no, was going to say, uh, mo you know, modern feminism would say this is all about control. This is about saying that the the the, uh, the husband rules the house and she did everything wrong. She has to listen to that. And that that's bullcrap. Everything I'm hearing from you is talking about personal responsibility and doing it together as that nuclear family, the way it's supposed to be done. So just so we could dispel some of that that I could feel uh, somebody trying to bring at us already. Looking back uh, during that whole process, 
What are some of the things that you were doing wrong uh, alongside of your wife? I went through a process uh, which I think really did help unlock us where I was going through the disciplines of the Christian life. And I went to uh, Lori and I said to her, I said, you know, I need to get rid of certain things in my life and I know it, but I can't see them clearly. Mm. And, and so remember, I'm, I'm doing this along with the fact that I'm actually teaching a lot of this in training and lecturing to my clients. Now, this has to do with staff relationships and getting along and, you know, that type of thing. But um, so I'm teaching a lot of these other things. And I realized that, you know, there's a possibility that I don't see clearly. So I said to her, I said, you know, what if we spent this evening together just cuddling in bed and let's walk through all of the things that I'm doing wrong? You know, and, and let me even bring up the things in my past that I've done wrong, because I want to get everything on the table before yep. the Lord and say, hey, I, I confessed it. It's out there. I can see it. So we went to bed. She was excited about going to bed eight o'clock that night. She usually goes to bed about eight or eight thirty pretty early. And so I hopped into bed with her and we started chatting. Well, this went till midnight. I mean, we went through a lot of stuff. and then. The next night, it was eight to midnight. And then the next night, this went on for like 10 nights. 10 nights. Now, remember, we're focused on just me. That's, <laughs> that's how much there was. That was just exciting. Get through me. And all of the, and I really wanted to see it. I wanted to see for myself. Now, at the same time, you know, the Lord works all of this out at the right timing. I'm going through a process of trying to understand what it looks like to have a new life in Christ. So that's one of the foundations as to why I was looking to get everything out of the table. You know, here okay. it is, laying it out. So in any case, you know, and there were questions like, well, you didn't kiss her, did you? <laughs> you know, because, you know, I'm traveling 40% of the year and, and there's this rumor out there that somehow I've had an affair. You know, uh -huh. well, no, never have had an affair, but boy, you, you talk about all the rumors out there. Well, then it became, it becomes, oh, it's an emotional affair. You, you had an, no, never had an emotional affair. We had an affair through messenger. <laughs> I mean, these people are hilarious. The, the accusations that they'll give. By Who the would grace of God, accusations like that though, Ken? What's that? No, I'm not asking you to name any names, but why would somebody make those type of accusations against you? Was it just the outside influences trying to get into your marriage? No, th these are the haters for the transformed wife. Oh, and they're actually, after this. there's actually there's blogs that are set up to hate us. Oh, I can imagine. So I can imagine. So, yeah, there's there's places that are set up to actually hate on us. Me and too. they will throw these rumors out. But there was one particular uh, person who wrote for, um, oh, it's, I forget the name of the um, the site. But in any case, she would write regularly about us and just share all kinds of lies. For instance, my children, this is a lie. My children will not allow the transfer wife or Lori to be around the grandkids. Now, you know how we know that. There's some neighbor in our neighborhood that has told them that. Okay, so now this gets published and this is nationwide all over the place. And the hilarious part is that Lori probably spends 20 to 25 hours a week with these grandkids because they keep dumping them off at the house. <laughs> And a lot of the times, if this was a neighbor, they would see they're out front. She's got five or six kids running around out front while she's out there watching them. And this goes on for hours every week. You know, so I'm just saying these are the lies that are out there and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, it's just it's one of those things. Satan is the father of lies. And so you got lots of lies flying around and, uh, you know, you're. I'm writing on somebody's Facebook page. And the next thing you know, I'll get somebody who slanders me by saying, well, what about your affairs? <laughs> no yes, affairs. They want to Never shut started. you up. Yeah. No, I understand. Exactly. You, you've been there. You've seen uh, it. I've been it's through all, it. 
<laughs> and, and these are supposedly Christians. That's that's the worst part of this is that, that some of these people, you know, really believe they're Christians. Now, to to take this a, bit, a step further, though, one of the reasons why Lori allows a lot of conversation on her her pages without blocking people. Now, that doesn't mean she hasn't blocked a lot of people, but if she can, she's going to leave them alone. And um, the reason is that probably two to three times a week, she will get a uh, email or a message from somebody that says, when I first started listening to you, I hated you. I hated That's everything you said. Yeah. And yet now after following you, and I have no idea why I kept following you, I believe everything you're saying. Awesome. I am completely changed. My marriage is different. My kids are different. My, you know, so th God's going to take this and use it is the bottom line in, in what's happening there. But no, I am married to one of the most joyful, wonderful grandmas there can ever be. I mean, and talk about a servant's heart. She just has a great servant's heart that did not exist in the first 20 years of our marriage. She had a servant's heart for the children. But other than that, it didn't broaden out much further than that you know, especially not to her husband, but now she has a servant's heart for everybody. And, and so it's, that's even transformed. So, so how did these people even know, like, this is, this is how bad some of that hate can be though, guys, that you're traveling out of town, what your work schedule is like, your grandkids, all this type of stuff. Like, how did they even know about this in the, in the first place? Know about what? Like yeah, with your, your, your home life, does, does your wife talk about like you having to travel for work and everything? Well, no, I don't know if that's the case about travel, but um, uh, certainly there's some things that come out that they will see. And certainly there are connections somewhere, but most okay. of it's just made up. It just, this comes out it's of the air. Up. Yeah. It's made up. You know, it's, it's taking a little piece of something, you know, for instance, the my affair uh, is the result of trying to talk to a woman on Messenger about submission because she disagreed with submission mm -hmm. and she wanted to have her pastor involved. So she was sharing with her pastor everything that I was saying, and then he was getting back to her and she wanted another. She asked another question. So I answered another question. So this went on for two or three days. And all of a sudden I had an emotional affair with somebody and they have all the paperwork. They have all these messages. <laughs> so my question is show them. I want to see these messages. They probably are all biblical. Were those church people? <laughs> so, yes. Supposedly these are church people. I've At least seen the it. person who shared it oh, okay. was a church person who then shared it with a, a person who used to be a Christian, became an atheist and now hates Christians and all, you know, the conservative Christian movement. So she's been writing against all kinds of Christians for years. You know, gotcha. it's just, that's who she is. So that's where a lot of this comes from is one particular individual who just is a hater. Uh, I know. understand. But, I'm, right. I'm a son of a pastor. Both of my granddads was pastors. I was raised in the church and the story that you're telling me right now is not uncommon. I've heard it many times before and they'll try oh, to make yeah. something out of nothing. Um, I, it's, it's crazy. And it's, again, it's supposed to be coming from Christians and that's very disheartening. Well, the father of lies is who Satan. Yeah. <laughs> so he's the father of lies, but that, you know, back to the story there where this thing, there's a synergy of things that are happening at one time, including the fact you know, when she, her eyes are finally opened in reading Created to Be His Help Me, she, I'm walking downstairs because I work out of this office that I'm in right now for the last okay. 20 years here, but I've worked on my own for the last 30, 35 years. So I, I run my own company and, um, and I work with my sons now, awesome. but, um, but in any case, uh, she says to me, I finally figured it out. I said, well, what'd you figure out? You know, how we can have an intimate relationship. I said, well, that's great. What do I need to do now? I'm always game. You know, if I need to do something to change so we can get there, I'm in, I'm all in. 
And she just kind of bowed her head a little bit and said, no, it's nothing you can do. It's something I need to do. Mm. I need to please you. I looked at her and said, well, I like the way that sounds. <laughs> and I headed off to my office. And she came running after me. And she runs through the door of my office and says, what can I do right now, right now to please you? Well, I wasn't thinking fast enough or you know where we'd be. And I said, you know, my shirts are never ironed. So I get to, you know, I'm running out the door to try to get to uh, catch a plane. I've got to iron some shirts. You know, so could you maybe iron a few shirts for me? She said, oh, yeah. She runs out, irons two shirts, and she comes back and goes, boy, that irony, that's awfully tiring. Could I maybe iron a few shirts every day? And I said, you know, I'm just happy you're trying to please me. And she says, you don't believe me, do you? I said, Lori, I say white, you say pink. I say purple, you say blue. We argue about everything. everything. <laughs> She sticks her hand out to shake my hand and I grab her hand. She shakes my hand and she says, yes, and we will never argue again. <laughs> and I said, can I test you? And she said, yeah, you can test me. Well, I went about testing her for the next couple of days, maybe, maybe a week. And I mean, I'm trying to take my dishes off the table and go do them myself because I'm going to get in trouble if I don't. <laughs> and she hips me off of the sink and says, I'll do your dishes, you know? So, I mean, just everything. I tested her and she was passing with flying colors. So four kids sitting at the table and we're having dinner. She's on the opposite side and she and I are just kind of goo-gooing each other and laughing and the kids are carrying on. And it struck me. I am falling in love with this woman like I've never loved her before. Mm, that's awesome, man. I don't think I loved her this much when I married her. And it's been that way for the last 23 years or so. It's been totally amazing to mm. watch this transformation. And it happened at the time where she's suffering terrible headaches. I mean, terrible headaches. So bad that they were nine and tens and we were going to every doctor we could to try to solve it, to get medication. Everything she tried, she'd try it once and it didn't work. I mean, or, mm. or she hated it. Like some of the drugs they would give her, you know, made her want to commit suicide. So why take that drug again? You know, so here's this poor woman who would go underneath the guava tree outside the window of our home, looking into our home and sit there for hours in the day. Nothing, no phone, no nothing, because she was so sick and we didn't know what to do and where to go, where to turn. I said to her, Lori, why are you outside <laughs> under the guava tree? And she said, my life is so miserable. Why would I want to make everybody else's life miserable? Oh, man. She was just getting away. So as it turns out, she had a brain tumor. So oh, she finally went down, ended up in ICU, Cerebral sodium wasting was what was diagnosed, but the bottom line was she had a, a brain tumor. And that's a whole long story, but you can see this convergence of things that are happening where I'm challenging her, created to be his help meet, comes in and gives the Lord's answers. The brain tumor hits, gives life a whole different perspective. I'm sitting at her bedside as she's getting the brain operation and, you know, just being her hero to her and just the transformation came right out of that. So God pulled all this together and we know why now. I mean, when we look back, we know exactly why she would not have the ministry she has today <laughs> if we hadn't gone through this together. Now we hate it in the sense that we lost out on so many years. Yeah. You know, you'd think, when this transformation hit, that we both would be just so enthusiastic and this would be fantastic. And yet she was as depressed as I've ever seen her in my life. She's not a depressed woman at all. But for six months, she was really down. Now, remember, she's having headaches too, which could have a, a problem. But her main issue was, I wasted so much of our marriage. Mm. I, I wasted it. 
you know? I said, Lord, you didn't waste it. We had good times. Look what we got out of this, four beautiful children. You know, we, we've done so much well together, but yes, we could have had this early in our marriage. And that would be my, my counsel to any man or woman who's listening to this. Don't waste it. You know how many marriages, including her parents' marriage, her parents' marriage was not a great marriage, but after watching her transform, it became better. And then mom ended up with a debilitating disease that took her life five to six years later. Mm. And her dad took such good care of mom. And mom fell madly in love with dad, probably for the first time. They had just the most unbelievable marriage at the end of their lives. And you mm. see that with older people where I've seen it. sticking it out yeah. and loving each other and staying together. And the only problem is you wasted so many good years together. Mm -hmm. Oh, the fun you could have. Uh, Lori and I, we can't stop talking and laughing together. I mean, it's just, it's you know, nonstop. Now, part of that has to do with some of the responses we get that are off the wall or hating us. And we will we'll literally laugh about it because she's just, you know, she just laughs. She just thinks it's funny that, yeah, you know, it, it's sad in a way but we're not going to let that get to us. We're not right. going to let that steal our joy Good. and uh, and come up against us. So, but no, she's been, uh, she's just a very joyful, wonderful person. And, um, you know, I think that I picked up some of that joy or more of that joy because of that. How did that transformation in your marriage trickle down into your family with your kids and your grandkids? <laughs> you know, the kids didn't see uh, us arguing. Our okay. arguing was a lot of silent arguments in a sense, or away from the kids. It was something we kind of decided we would do was away from the kids. And we had plenty of time away from the kids to argue, but I would get these looks and these frowns and these, you know, whatever, because Lori's the Lori's Lori. You see it in her blog. She's very prophetically oriented, black and white. Here it is. And that can be great, especially when it comes to health and health things. Well, that was one of our biggest arguments. I was a junk food junkie at heart. She is a uh, health purist, you know, vegetarian for a long time. Now she eats meat. She realizes how important that is oh, to yeah. keep the body going is to eat meat. So she'll have meat once a week now, um, you know, and always ate fish and chicken, but I'm talking about red meat. Um, yeah. But she's changed a lot of the way she looks at things. But uh, you look at her attack on seed oils, for instance. <laughs> you know, don't eat any of that canola or soy oil because that's the worst thing for you. And it's probably true. I mean, the research is showing that. Yeah. But this is who she is. She wants to do everything right. And that's why she was so devastated when she realized that I'm the problem. Now, we all have to come to that conclusion at some point. Yeah. At some point in our life, we all have to say to ourselves, I'm the problem. Now, let me go fix me. You know. And so she was unwilling to do that because of that little hurt girl inside of her in her relationship with her dad. And breaking that open and, and, and curing that allowed for a lot. So our kids, I think at first were skeptical over her, you know, a little skeptical over her writing and everything. She'd been mentoring women for years and we thought she would have this little blog. You know, she woke up one day and said, Hey, you know, can, I can't mentor anymore because she was debilitated at the time. Couldn't even go anywhere. Mm. I can't mentor women directly, but I, I think I can do a little blog that I've set up really for one person in Chicago is leaving San Diego, going to Chicago. And I want to keep in touch with her. So Cassie set up a blog for me and I'm going to get 30 followers. I bet I said to her, you're going to get a hundred. <laughs> well, over a hundred thousand later, you know, she's still mentoring and still doing all of this. Uh, for women and doing even better, I think. I mean, just the stuff she's coming up with is phenomenal. And I, I just see her being led by the spirit in uh, in doing a lot of this stuff. So, uh -huh. but uh, 
Yeah. What was that question though that you just asked? I yeah, you know, I think it it had a. I, I was talking about how it trickled down to your family with your marriage, There's kids, this transformation. Right. How did, how did that uh, trickle down to the overall family? Well, the family was still here at the time when we really started working through our new lives in Christ. Now, remember, this all comes together. So one of our favorite uh, or probably our most favorite Bible teacher is a guy named Michael Pearl. And we get hit for that, too, because you know, supposedly he teaches spanking and abuses kids and, you know, all of this stuff. So, and so we did spank our kids, but we did find that up to about age five was all we ever needed to spank them. You know, it well, was just a swat. A kid. You know, generally speaking, but after five, you know, we had, in a sense, their attention and their respect. And right. so we could use other means of discipline after that. <clears throat> Even if we might threaten to paddle them, we didn't have to do it because they, they were cooperative kids. So my advice to dads and moms out there is you really should have control over your children by age three. <laughs> three and a half at the latest, because it's going to be a, a much harder battle when they're four, five, six, and then teenagers if they've never learned that no means no. Right. So, you know, Stephen comes home one day, his friend is in trouble one more time. He can't go surfing for a month because his friend is on, you know, probation or whatever it is. And uh, mom asks him, Lori says to him, well, what's the difference between you and your friend? And Stephen says, mom, I learned long ago when no means no and when no means maybe. <laughs> if no means maybe, I can press a little bit until you say no, you know, but he never learned that. So he always thinks that no means maybe, and he's going to press the limits, you know? So I think with children, you've got to raise them well. I also learned early on because of my training of, um, you know, thousands of people that you are what you think. And so we started training our children young how to think correctly. And I came up with the four most important things in life for the Alexanders. And the four most important things in life were love God and serve him, do what's right, be the best you can be, and treat others the way you'd like to be treated. So we got those into those children's heads early on. And when they would mess up on one of those things, we would call attention to it. Now, usually when you mess up on one, you messed up on all five. You think about it, you know, Ryan, you just got an F on your test. You know, were you treating mom and dad the way you'd want to be treated? And we're sending you to private school here and da, 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 da. You think God was pleased, you know, were you doing the best you could do? No. And he's sitting there going, no, no, no. And then you say to him, okay, don't do it again. And that's it. You know, you're training them to think right. And so we have that in our children where, we brought them up to really, really focus on those things, not on the do's and don'ts as much as what are you thinking about? I spent many hours with my teenage daughters, particularly, you know, talking about looks and, you know, my nose has freckles on it and, you know, wow. <laughs> things that people are making fun of me and, and not dealing so much with the behavior, but getting behind the behavior to the thinking. Same thing I had to do with my wife was deal with her thinking. Same thing I had to do with myself. What am I thinking? You know, when, when I'm there in despair over my wife, that she's not, she's just not becoming the wife that I want her to be, I have to think right. And my thinking is, wait a second, Ken. Two things came to mind. One is God would say to me, you do realize that the way she treats you is how you treat me often. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah, that's probably true. I need to get that together, don't I? And the second one is that dead things don't care. You know, in Romans 6, it says that we died with Christ. We were raised with him to a new life. We're dead to sin, freed from sin, alive in Christ Jesus. And so I would have to remind myself that dead things don't care. I don't care about the things of this world. I have to care about the eternal things that are up there. So this is a circumstance. It's happening to me. It hurts me. But I talked to men. I was talking to one just, just 
a few minutes ago on Messenger. He's all despaired and he's upset. And, and part of it, he knows that he's not living his life correctly. And so he's in trouble, you know? And so you have to say to him, if you are in Christ, you've got to realize that you're dead. <laughs> you know, start with that point. You are already dead. Now, step into your new life in Christ from this moment forward and start living for Christ. Well, we were teaching these things to our children and they basically have taken to them like, I don't know, they, they love it. They live this and they've selected spouses too, who are godly spouses. So I've got 15 grandkids and one on the way. And I am, I've got to be one of the most blessed men ever. And I just, it scares me sometimes. The blessings are so good. You say, Lord, you know, I love this. Please keep it coming. But, you know, it's just, I don't deserve this. I, I, I don't. Why me? And then I think to myself, well, somebody has to be the transformed wife's husband. <laughs> <laughs> somebody has to be the father to these children. You know, God has selected me to be in that role. And so I have to honor that and live that out as best that I can. So that's the goal, at least. Well, obviously, uh, you know, you can only speak so much for her. But I, I know you're talking about through this transformation, what it did for you to hear, hey, I want to please you. I, I want to do this for you. But she went through that initial depression with the, you know, the brain tumors and stuff after that season. And we got used to that change. How much happiness have you seen in Lori with your marriage? Well, she's a she's a different person completely. I mean, the frowns that used to be constant and the upsets, they I have to say they they really never happen. It's so if if there's a frown, it it's a half an instant. You know, there's just nothing there that um it's just amazing. She wakes up joyful. She goes to bed joyful, and, and the only time is if she's hurting. But even when she's hurting, it takes me a week sometimes to find out she's got a bad stomach. It takes me a week to oh. find out she's been suffering from a headache or a sinus infection. She just plows through it in an amazing fashion. Um, but yes, she's just, she's certainly, I would say she's the most joyful person I've ever seen, except for one other, and that's my mom. Uh, and that's the crazy thing is, you know, I married this woman who I wanted to be like my mom and she was kind of the opposite of my mom. And now she's kind of completely like my mom. My mom was so full of joy that she had a song going for everything you talked to her about. If you came and complained about anything, she'd give you a song right back with a big smile. You know, <laughs> that's just who she was. And um and Lori's, she's pretty much that way. She's singing all the time. She, a lot of times, will be sitting out front of our home in the sunshine. She loves to be in the sunshine in her chair. And she's just on her phone, you know, either mentoring women or blogging or coming up with new ideas or reading. She reads a lot of scriptures. She listens to a lot of commentaries every day. <clears throat> and uh, if she's not doing that, she's taking care of grandkids. You know, a little bit for me. I'm, I'm, I've always been good at taking care of myself. So there's not a whole bunch she has to do for me, but uh, I do appreciate the things she does do for me, um, you know, in, in the process. But no, she's very joyful. She walks the talk, you know, exactly what she's like mentoring. <clears throat> I, and I wouldn't say that happened overnight. There were many times that she would come to me and say, I just wrote this. Now I have to do it. <laughs> so I mean, she's, she's writing it. And so, you know, the, a lot of those days are gone. But in her early days, a lot of it was a challenge to herself, mm -hmm. you know, where she needed to improve and what she, she needed to do. But um, she pretty much has it down. I'm trying to think of, yeah, um, she's amazing. Totally amazing. A uh, woman that I have the privilege of being married to now, and uh, and I can tell you, my first twenty years of marriage, I was bad at complaining to my friends and others about her. <laughs> I was bad because I just I needed somebody to say, 
you know, to talk to about it. Well, you talked a little bit about that, but talk about those outside influences that get inside of our marriages when we're talking with friends and, you know, not, not to, you know, point this towards women, but I think a lot of times, especially if your, your, your wives or your spouses have single women, they go talk to a misery loves company. And they can get inside that relationship and you got to be careful with what you bring inside of your marriage. Uh, how, how much does those outside influences and those friendships play in to these marriages and the problems that they're facing? Well, too much, way too much. There are so many marriages that are broken up by a wife's parents. Mm. The wife's parents don't approve of whoever she's married. Now, these are Christian parents. And it's when she goes to mom and says, hey, mom, I've got this problem. Mom doesn't say he's the man you married. He's the man you've chosen to honor, respect and love. Now get back in there and fight for your marriage. She doesn't say that. She starts going along and listening. Uh huh. Yeah, I thought that might be the case. Yeah, that's mm. too bad. You know, it's like and that's the parents. Christian parents are pulling their their daughters away. Um, then on top of that, you've got the sisters and, and the brothers, you know, yep. who may be doing that, but uh, then family and friends. But what are the worst things? I mean, it seems to me, and Lori, Lori really doesn't like this, women's Bible studies, mm. where they degrade down to talking, okay, it's sharing time. Well, sharing time turns into, I've got this problem with my husband and he's so oh. this and he's so that. And instead of getting a word of encouragement and move forward and let's pray for you, every other woman jumps in and starts sharing their problems. And mm. here's, yeah, mine's just as bad. He also da, 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 da. And some older godly woman should put a stop to that immediately and say, Julie, that's something you and I need to talk about afterwards. Let's pray for Julie now. Uh, there was one gentleman who came to me for help and he explained to me that his wife it started a Bible study where it actually was more like a wine drinking party where there were seven other women and a leader and the leader was a divorce attorney. All the other women were divorced except for his wife. Now, what do you think the chances were that she wouldn't end up divorced? <laughs> oh, Those are the outside influences. Instead of listening to you know the word and being in the word every day, you know, listening to godly, and this is why Lori really would love to get an army of godly older women who are out there, not just online, but in the lives of these women. Tell me this, <clears throat> how can we have a thousand Christian women running around the United States, lecturing in women's conferences and sometimes to men, and yet not a one of them will touch exactly what God told them to speak on. I he tells was them not to speak. That. Yeah. <clears throat> and yet they will not touch the fact that God asked them to train the younger women to love their husbands, be keepers at home, live chaste and godly lives. Where, where is the disconnect in the church? And then our churches and our pastors and inviting these women in and never vetting them to ask them that question. Why are you not teaching what God has asked you to teach? You've got a great platform. You've got a great ministry. Why aren't you doing it? And the answer is probably pretty simple because I'm not living it. Mm. <laughs> I'm not that. doing it. How many churches have you seen that are talking about these issues right here? The only one I've ever seen is John MacArthur's church and then our church now where we go. And those are the only two that I've ever really seen. I know there's some others out there, but there are so few churches that will stand on this important premise. Where is it that we've lost this idea that the older godly women are trained younger women? How many churches have a mentoring program? We went to a church that had one. And it was a big, large church. Lori was always given the toughest assignments. These women who are about to divorce, their husbands are having affairs. And it was just amazing to watch the transformations and, and to have Lori nudge me and, hey, look back there. A year ago, I mentored that woman. She's there with her husband mm. and they're in church now. 
See, so an older godly woman coming alongside of this other woman who's about to divorce and saying, hey, stick with it. See, see the miracle that God could do in your life. But they won't do that. They'll be listening to friends and others. But why don't we have that platform? Now, even in this larger church, two thirds of the mentors were divorced women. Two thirds of the women mm. mentoring other women are already divorced. So we've got a huge problem in the church and the church's problem I mean, is many fold, but one of the biggest problems is that feminism has creeped in and the church has no response because it won't go to the Bible and find the answer. That's what Lori's message is all about. Your answer is there. It's sitting there waiting for you, pastors. You've got to get your family strong again. And the way to get your family strong again is mentor your wife. She has a book that, that is no commentary or very little commentary on her part. It's all Bible that is to train and is a mentoring book. 15 different chapters that anybody can take. And a lot of women do it on their own. But there's no reason. And I don't know of any other book out there like it. Interesting. How many years have we gone by and nobody's written a, a woman's mentoring book? All of the different aspects of being a godly Christian wife. And here's the Bible verses for them. Let's read them. Let's talk about them. And that's all that a, bio, a woman's Bible study has to do. And yet the pastors won't order the book for their congregation. And in part because, oh, that transformed wife, she's so controversial. You know, she's just... Can you believe what she says? And, and again, they believe the lies. She teaches abuse. We can say a thousand times that if you're being abused, call the police, seek help. But that doesn't do it for those who ha are haters, right? <laughs> That's not enough for them. You're teaching abuse if you actually believe that women should uh, you know, give their se husband sex regularly even if they don't feel like it. Well, husbands go to work every day and they don't feel like it. <laughs> there are certain responsibilities oh, in marriage. That's good. That's good. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things we do every day that we don't feel like. Why is sex so... It has to be a feeling. No, that's a lie. Total no. lie from Satan. <laughs> no feeling required, you know. But interestingly enough, in the middle of that sex session... There's a lot of feelings that come out and both of you are feeling good afterwards, right? Yeah. So God knew what he was doing. Reconnect At, on a regular basis. So now the church you're going to now, you said they're talking a little bit more about it. Did that come from seeing what Lori was doing? No, we found this church uh, by looking online during COVID. We were looking for another church that would teach biblical principles better than our church was doing. And at the time, the church we were going to, we suspected that they were picking up the feminist bent. Mm. Uh, when he started preaching on uh, certain passages, Lori would say to me, you heard this day? I said, yeah, I heard it. And finally, we got to a sermon where it was about women not speaking in the church. And halfway through the sermon, he called two women up on stage to speak. Mm. Somehow there's a disconnect there. I stood up and walked out. <laughs> I expected Lori to follow. She wondered where I went. I was like, okay. But in any case, um, I then sent the pastor a five-page letter outlining everything he had just taught in that sermon was wrong. I mean, everything was the feminist talking points that were out there. And there was no truth to it whatsoever. So... It's a big battle going on in that church right now. And this is two years later. We left it then and moved on. I went and talked to some of the elders about it and realized that the elders we had on the board had no idea about the Bible. Mm. They were not schooled in the Bible. They were good businessmen, but they didn't know what the word said. So, you know, I didn't want to take on that battle. And we did move on. It was COVID. It was convenient because the church was shut down. That particular church shut down for like nine months. Oh, wow. And the church we were we went to, it shut down for two months and then came right back. And if you wanted to come, you could come. And so we showed up there. 
during the middle of COVID, masks on, and and uh, we worship the Lord as we're told to do. And we just fell in love with it. It's, uh, you know, Master's College pastors, John MacArthur trained uh, Master's Seminary, you know, uh, pastors, and they're just fantastic. He just did a series uh, that was just phenomenal on, on this whole subject. And, um, you know, Laurie at times wants to stand up and cheer because <laughs> there's just so little of this being taught in the church. But our church fully accepts it. As a matter of fact, they, they love Lori. They just have embraced her and her message, you know, uh, fully in, in what they've done. Absolutely. So we, we love it there. Yeah. What's this, what's this been like for you watching how big her ministry has became and what she's been doing? And uh, what role do you play in her support uh, system in doing so? Well, I've had no regrets. You know, I, I this isn't a competition. Right. I, in my own right, have had tremendous success in the business world. So I've had as much success as I've wanted, and I've curtailed it for many years. I have uh, really reduced my exposure because of her illnesses mm -hmm. and for other reasons. I wanted to coach my boys' teams, for instance. And so I gave up a whole potload of money. <laughs> to be able to coach my boys. And I did that for a six month period and fell in love with it and decided I'm just going to keep doing this. Well, I retooled then and I kept doing things differently and retooling my business that I could do more and more from home. And in doing more and more from home, I was able to be with the kids and help raise them while she was sick as a dog. I mean, in bed uh, years, she had many, many years of illnesses. And this is all part of our story. But um, the success is phenomenal, and I, I love it for her. I'd love it for it to get even bigger, not just for the success part. She doesn't care that much. Whether she has 10 or 1,000, it's not going to make a difference to her. She's going to speak the same message. She's oh. not looking for more numbers. She's looking for lives that are changed. And so oh. I participate in it. I did used to write more on her blog, and she used to blog more. But we probably have, or she probably has well over 1,200, oh, 1,200, 2,000, 3,000 articles that address the key issues of, you know, a Christian family and life and marriage in both her old blog, Always Learning, and now her new blog, The Transform Wife. So she's written on almost every subject. Sometimes she'll take some of the old blogs and regurgitate them. I probably have maybe 70 of those that I've written on different things. And, and I think she would like it if I get enough time to start writing again, you know, and to yeah. be able to contribute some of that. But, um, and I've thought about starting a men's thing. I did actually at one point, but uh, it just got to be too time consuming. So I am part of a group called the men of God on Facebook. And it's, it's just a great group. And I, I'm one of the leaders in that group. And so I get some mentoring that I get to do there. I get some mentoring from, you know, Lori's blog. And that's how I help her is she'll get men who will write and just the saddest stories. And she doesn't mentor men. I mean, she'll just say, I don't mentor men, but here's Ken. And then I have a, a handout. It's probably 11 page handout that kind of goes through our story a little bit. And it's called Outside the Box. So there's a, a book called... Um, uh, leadership and Self-Deception. It, it's just a fantastic book for any leader to read. And it's about this whole idea that I'm not going to change my organization or anything in my life until I first take a look inside because I'm deceived. <laughs> I need to know who I am and see that clearly and make the right changes and step outside my own box in order to be able to help other people. And so that, based on that book, I've got a Christian aside to it but it basically shows how husbands and wives are to each other when they start getting into a fight and they're disconnected and they get into their box and start self-justifying the fact that they're now treating the other person in an unchristian way. And they think it's now okay. Well, no, it's never okay. No matter how I'm treated, I am never to mistreat somebody else. I'm never to say an unkind word. I'm never to argue. 
And, you know, that's always the big one. Uh, somebody writes, well, arguing is good for a marriage. If you don't argue in your marriage, then something's wrong with your marriage. <laughs> you know, all the time. That's yep. not what the scriptures teach. Yeah. It's, you know, the word teaches that we are not to argue and that we are to. That doesn't mean we don't say what we need to say. So right. speak it, say it clearly, say it kindly. And then I would have to say, Lori, I'm not going to argue about this anymore. You know, I've told you exactly what I'm thinking. You know what I'm thinking. We don't need to argue about it. Let's just agree to disagree. And again, that's one of the things I discovered was she felt we couldn't have an intimate relationship if we didn't agree on everything. It just took her a long time to realize that true intimacy comes when you accept the other person for who they are and what they're thinking, even when you disagree with them. That's what true and, intimacy and true love is, is not yeah. having to agree. So oh. it, it took a while to do that. But yeah, I, I don't regret anything that she's doing or I'm not jealous of it at all. I encourage her. One of the things I ask her to do is send me these testimonials of these women who have completely changed, the ones that hated her and now love her. And so I get them. She, you know, she doesn't like to send them. So she said, I don't send you all of them, but the best ones I'll send you. And so she sends those to me and that encourages me to see how the ministry is doing. And of course you can read the Facebook comments. Oh yeah. And I know that's got to make you proud. Cause even though, you know, I know you said Lori told him like, I don't mentor men. There's men all over that blog because they're saying they want that too. They want to see this happen in their relationships. People think that men uh, don't want these healthy marriages or that don't want to settle down. Yes, they do. And they are encouraged by seeing her speak about this. It's crazy because people see me called dad talk. Predominantly, I, I have just as many women in here because they're wanting to see strong dads. You know, it's all oh, about yeah. the family unit and coming together. Uh, don't have these, you know, uh, people have these misconceptions, but they don't realize there's a lot of people that are watching and it's helping a lot of people. So I, I think that is so amazing. But you you talk about mentoring these men in your experience, mentoring these men that are trying to find out about these things. What are some of the biggest issues and challenges that these men are facing in their marriages? There's so many, but the biggest challenge is a wife who cannot see. Mm. She's blind. That no matter how he tries to explain it to her, she can't see because she has jumped into her box and she is justifying why she is mistreating him. Mm. There's always a reason why I'm mistreating you. And here's why. The crazy thing to me is to watch a wife, and I'm mentoring a couple right now, she just filed for separation, mm. mentoring him for two years. And she just filed for separation. And she, she doesn't realize that, you know, I've, I've watched them both and he's got some problems, but he's done a good job of trying to work on them and stay cool and not say hurtful things. But there isn't enough money in the relationship, you know, or in the family. Yeah. And she wants to keep spending. Spend, 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 spend. So then she goes out and works and her money is her money, but his money is family money. <laughs> you know, spend, 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 spend. And yet if he doesn't, you know, spend exactly when she wants it to be spent and how she wants to be spent, he says, well, I can't. We're saving that money for taxes. You know, so there's all these arguments that come, but she doesn't realize that she is twice as bad as he is. She will just come unglued and wail on him and be the most meanest thing you could ever imagine. The, the things she says to him are awful. And yet for some reason, that doesn't count. <laughs> you know, he did this or he did that. And I start adding them up and I think, yeah, but when you come down on him, you are so nasty and mean. And then it takes him two or three days to get back in relationship, buy you flowers and candy and tell you he loves you. And, and then finally, when he's been in the doghouse long enough, you let him out. And, and this is a, you know, regular thing out there, unfortunately, that I, I don't know whether women are more blind than men, but I think they are. What can and it make sense is that, in that type of a relationship, though, uh, it's, it's to to get them to understand what's going on? I mean, there's just so much outside influence 
that says that this is the way it's supposed to be. Well, it's that, but it is it is just the way they process information compared to a man. I go up to a man and I say to him, you've got this problem. One, two, three, four. He looks back at me and goes, you might be right. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's all he says. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to work on it, but yeah, you could be right. Where she's going to say, no way. I can't believe you said that. There's no, She doesn't even want to be introspective. Now, that's not yeah. every woman, obviously. And there are women now who have trained themselves to be introspective. And of course, the worst part is the woman who is too introspective. She always thinks it's her fault. You yeah. know, so there's a spectrum here. But in that spectrum, there's this defensiveness that is coming in so many of our Christian marriages, whereas we should be able to each as a spouse go to the other spouse and say, hey, I've got a problem with you here. Can you please think and pray about this? And the other person look back and go, you may be right. Let me think and pray about it, you know, and let's let's work on that. It doesn't have, we don't have to get defensive about it. Let's just process that. But for some reason, many times there's this, uh, this hurt, this thing that goes beyond the thing, <laughs> whether it goes back to the parents or whether it goes back to some hurt that they've had or some fear that they have or whether it's just the need to be in control. I mean, there is a significant number out there that it's really just a control issue. That if I can keep my husband on his toes, and, and this is why, you know, honey, I just got a big promotion. We're gonna make $200 more a week. And then the next thing you know is some word of disrespect, like that's all, you know, that boy, you've been with that company for so long, you know, they're just mistreating you. Mm. And or you're just not doing the job right, one or the other. It's like, <laughs> I just, you know, so even coming with good news that used to happen with me with my wife. Here's the good news, and I get this snide remark. And then in retrospect, she says, "Well, I just felt like I needed to keep your ego under control." Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, too <laughs> much ego. You know, I didn't want you to get a big head. Well, a person that's not you confident know? is easier to control. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, Right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Who knows exactly what the, you know, why is the bottom line is this, is that when we go back to the good book and we do things God's ways, we reap his blessings. I mean, that's the story of my life. I can't say it any clearer than that. And I'm not taking any credit for it. The only reason why I'm here today and have the life that I have a highly successful life and in almost every domain, you know, including physical fitness. I mean, I try to get my five, six miles in a day. Now it's in pickleball, but uh, you know, and, and I eat right and do whatever. But the only reason is a God reason. It's there, all yeah. to his glory. He decided that he wanted this with me. And, and if it wasn't for him, then I probably would be divorced on some second marriage, having different set of problems with kids who are messed up. You know, he's the one who orchestrated the whole thing from start to finish. Even the job that I got was a miracle, a God thing. You know, I theoretically should be teaching in a seminary somewhere. I mean, that's what I should be doing. I've, I've got the degrees for it. <laughs> I just all of a sudden became successful in another domain and God blessed it and I went with it. And I have to assume that's what he wanted for me. Well, I, you know? and, and you're explaining this so well on the outside, it's going to be like, oh, I look at these men just saying they want better wives, you know, and uh, they're, they're, they're not talking about their own personal faults. Yes, we are. Uh, but I would say this to any of the women that are watching this, um, Ken, tell them about how this made you want to be a better husband at the same time. Well, I, I've always had a desire to please other people and including have a great marriage. So I've always had that, but I carried the baggage in from the way my dad was. I didn't realize how much that was. And remember, I thought that was the way it should be. But if anybody crossed dad or did something wrong, you get a snap of the fingers or a displeasing look. And I mean, it silenced us. 
you know, and so I didn't realize how I could put my wife in her place with unkind words. You know, in my mind, I'm just, you know, setting evening the field up here. She just did this to me. I'm going to even up the field, you know, here. So there was some baggage that I carried into the relationship. Mm. And, and probably the biggest baggage beyond that is I don't know of a young man at 22 who's mature. <laughs> no. who, who understands that, no. you know, it isn't that hard to pick up a dish after you've used it. You don't need to leave it sitting beside the couch. You know, it's not that hard to clean up after yourself. You know, it's not that hard to get the clothes into the hand, hamp, hamper, guys. Now, on the flip side, Lori would teach if he doesn't, you know, be a servant to him. But guys, it's not that hard. Ask your wife three things that you would love. She would love to see you change in. And you're going to find that they're the easiest things you could ever do. Most of them are so easy. And yet you've just discounted them because you haven't wanted to do them. I Ask hate her for three. Clothes. I hate them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ask her for three things. And then for one month, work on those three things. And if you get them and you do them, you get a reward you guys decide what the reward is. And if you don't do them, every time you don't do them, there's some accountability. You owe her a back rub or a foot massage, or you've got to do the dishes that night. I mean, you, you've got to train yourself to get out of the bad habits. So give yourself three things that you're going to challenge yourself on. And you're asking her to help you with this. And then the next thing, you know, maybe just maybe she's going to want to work on three things. <laughs> yeah, you go. And you begin working together. And the crazy thing is this when we started that process, we did that together. Uh, the three things were that she wanted me to squeegee down the shower. That was a big one. We, we fought for years over squeegeeing down that shower because men don't squeegee showers. But <laughs> she wanted that shower squeegee. So, okay, I can squeegee the shower. Pick up the newspapers after I finish reading them. But what's the problem there? I've never finished. So, okay, I can pick up the newspapers and then be nice to me. Now, I don't know exactly what that meant, but I had to try to figure out ways <laughs> to be nice to her. And, um, and so in any case, we worked on those three. And if I didn't do one of those three, she could call me on it. And then the easiest way of doing that was just say my name, say my name until it stops, whatever it is. If I'm not being nice, I'm saying unkind things. I said to her, just say my name. So I heard Ken. Ken, Ken, <laughs> and then I run off to my office and realize, wait a second, I asked her to do this and I have to go downstairs and apologize. Well, it didn't take more than a month to start losing so many bad habits. They just disappear. So then work on three more. And then you start getting into the really heavy ones, <laughs> you know, but work together on just three things, just identify what they are, come to agreement on them and see whether or not you can't, um, you know, get these changes done in your life. And once you start that momentum process going, it really works great. So. Well, I, I, I tell you, I was going to say, uh, you know, what, what's something that you could say to the men, but that was kind of speaking to both right there. I, I think you answered it perfectly. And I just want to say, I thank you so much for coming and doing uh, what you're doing today. Are you planning on doing more speaking later? Are you planning on starting anything? Uh, if anybody wanted to get in touch with you about mentoring, how could they uh, reach out to you? Well, generally they reach out through Lori's, uh, through the Transform Wife blog, just through her email. Um, I'm not looking for mentoring. My plate's full, uh, so to speak. But um, yes, I'm, I am available if somebody really needs to reach me, um, generally through um, the transformwife.com and the, the email address there. Um, who knows? Once I get retired... I keep saying I'm cutting back and, and this is the first six months that I've actually done that um, to a large degree. So we'll see, you know, it's just, it's always hard when you've been successful in a business to give it up and it may be time to give it up and start going into full-time ministry. That's what I would say always to these haters who tried to shut down my business and my business grew every year. But I would say to them, you know, if, if the Lord ever slows my business down, you know, I'm going to go into 
full-time ministry. <laughs> so be careful what you're wishing for here um, in, in what you're doing. So I, I do love to minister. I'm happy to speak more you know, and do more podcasts and that type of thing potentially, because this one was fun. It's actually one of the first ones I've done uh, because yeah. of my time limitations, but um, appreciate you having me on. Oh, 100%, man. I was, like I said, I was sitting back listening to it and I was like, I'd like to talk to him myself. And then I, I want to talk to Lori. Um, and, and I would ask you guys, I can only imagine how much more a message like this is going to be attacked. There's not many people doing what you and your wife are doing and we need more of it. Um, guys, make sure you're getting out there and supporting and letting people know about this resource. I mean, here we go. The one place that, that we should be hearing this type of stuff is the churches. I can't tell you that I've heard this talked about much in the church, Ken. And that that bothers me. It really does. As you know, as a, as a uh, child that grew up in the ministry, I never heard this talked about in the church. Uh, and I don't think it's not because my dad wouldn't have wanted to, but we just didn't hear much on it. There she is, Lori. How you doing? Hi. Ah, Good, how are you? I am doing great. I am really enjoying this. I love seeing what you guys are doing right here. And uh, I just want to say thank you for that, because I know you're really fighting back against those norms in society and that feminism. I can only imagine what that's been like for you. I know it's got to have its challenges at times. Yeah, I, I've gotten pretty good at ignoring it and not allowing it to steal my joy or stop me from writing what I feel very convicted about. And and because I receive letters every day from women telling me how much my ministry has changed their lives because God's word never comes back void. So we're promised to be persecuted. I don't like to really use that word because I'm so blessed. You know, I don't really feel persecuted. I have so many, so many supporters that are cheering me on. So <laughs> we have, we're covered in prayer. We yeah. are covered so much in prayer. We, we do covet the prayers of anybody listening here. Keep us in your prayers and uh, especially Lori and her health, because we want her to keep going for many years. But yes, our, our desire would be for the pastors to finally get it, to finally understand that the reason why your church is broken is because you stopped the basic ministry of training women to love their husbands and be keepers at home. I'm going to go. I'm kind of kneeling down here. I'm getting tired. No, it's okay. <laughs> that, that is okay. I'm going to let you guys go. I mean, really quick. I, I don't know before you, before you, uh, your knees get weak there, Lori, how many <laughs> marriages have you seen that were on the brink of breaking up that came to this blog and talked to you guys that are now um, still together? I, I don't know. I, I get letters, every messages every day. So that's what it's all about. Hundreds, that's maybe thousands. I don't know. Very many, a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for what you do. Miracles. You're welcome. <laughs> All the ones that the Lord will use, and they've got to have open hearts to it. Once they have an open heart, the rest of it, the Lord will do. We, we don't have to worry about it as long, but you got to have that open heart. Yep. There you go. Oh, and mind and open up that mind too. <laughs> so to the truth. But thank you for having us on. Bye. Appreciate it. Or having me on. And <laughs> yeah. And you can you can talk to Lori and she'll give you her side of the story later. Well, it's all over. Let's the do internet, it. My story. <laughs> bye bye. Right. Okay. Much.